All right, we are underway. Section 23, page 166 in your notebook. Let's do a little bit of review. So we'll see how we got to where we are tonight. Uh, last week, we looked at the 30-minute video, uh, The Miracle of 48 in Against All Odds, where we saw some firsthand reports of some very unusual incidents in the lives of some of the soldiers during the uh, War of Independence. Some pretty amazing stuff there. And again, those type of stories happen or come out of every one of Israel's wars. They're not that unusual. It's amazing. All right, then uh, we saw that Israel became a member of the UN. And uh, there's the Israeli flag being raised in the UN plaza. Abba Iban is there, Abba Iban is there the uh, third from the left. Uh, Brian, uh, uh, David Ben-Gurion was elected the first Prime Minister of Israel. Then uh, Chaim Weizmann elected the first President of Israel. I believe that this guy did, did a tremendous amount to put the first state in place. And the Knesset, the government, started functioning, functioning as well. There's a picture of the Knesset building. Immediately after Israel became a state, a tremendous, unprecedented immigration began of Jewish people from the Arab world, usually under duress, some kind of pressure on them to uh, make life unbearable in the uh, Arab state that they were living in. So literally, thousands upon thousands of Jewish people came to Israel beginning in May of 1948. And you have this map in your, in your book. One of the more famous uh, immigration incidents was the airlift of Yemenite Jews from uh, Yemen, here in the southwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula, airlifted up to Israel. Uh, thousands of them, again, airlifted in DC-4s, planes a lot smaller and a lot slower, a lot less sophisticated than what we have today, uh, packed with 200 Yemenite Jews per flight around the clock. Uh, 200 Jews at a flight, many, many flights. Thousands were, were uh, brought into Israel. Uh, Question. Where did they go when they got to Israel? Uh, I'll let that be answered by the DVD we're going to see okay. in uh, just a few minutes. Because the DVD we're going to look at today covers the immigration crisis. Okay? Then we talked about the uh, law of return, uh, which really began with the brother Daniel Case, where uh, Shmuel Rufison, or Oswald Rufison, uh, a Jewish man who had um, uh, converted to Catholicism and become a Carmelite monk, tried to in enter Israel uh, based on his Jewish heritage and was refused entrance on the law of return. By the way, he eventually did get into Israel as a non-Jew. If you want to read about Oswald Rufesen, I was informed about this book here called In the Lion's Den. The Life of Oswald Rufesen. I haven't read it myself, but I did read the um, little blurb about it on Amazon.com. And uh, I read, I've read up a little bit on his life. He, um, he, was, he, he passed himself off as a Polish German, or a German Pole, I guess, because he was fluent in German. And he ended up working for the Nazis in the little town he was in. And as a working for the commander of that little town, he was able to feed information to, uh, to the ghetto and to Jewish people. He saved a lot of Jewish lives. A spy Say again? A spy? Would he, would he be called a spy? Well, yeah, he was kind of working as a spy. Yeah. And uh, he helped arm uh, some of the ghettos. He even helped, I think it was a, a little town, uh, escape the Nazis by warning them. He eventually was found out, and he had to flee for his life. He became a partisan fighter. And so he fought the Nazis eventually ended up in a convent, I believe it was, and became a believer in Jesus and of some sort, and became a Carmelite monk. And then, of course, tried to enter Israel uh, based on its Jewish heritage. So it's a fascinating story, and uh, the details are there apparently in this book by Nechama Tech. So if you're interested in the life of Oswald Rufesen, he's a number, another one of those amazing people who went through amazing experiences during the Holocaust, World War II, and the beginning of the State of Israel. Uh, Question. If a Jew in Israel claims Yeshua as their Lord and Savior, 
If a, do they lose their citizenship? Not if they're if they're a native Israeli, if they're sovereign, no, they can't lose their citizenship. But if you come into the country under false pretenses and uh, you, they find out that you're a Jewish believer, they can kick you out and revoke your citizenship. Yes, definitely. So that's one of the reasons I don't even attempt Aliyah. I mean, I can't lie about it. So I would never be allowed in the country. Okay, so... That brings us now to 1950 again. We looked at the uh, law of return as it went through twists and turns, 1978, 1959, uh, 1989, 1992, etc. So now, uh, jump into your time machine. We're now going to return to 1950. Okay, did you feel that? Do -do 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 -do. We're now back in 1950, okay? And it's the uh, airborne transfer of 121,000 Jews from Iraq to Israel. So everybody there, page 166. The emigration from Yemen was soon followed and ultimately surpassed by a massive airlift of Jews from Iraq. Now, you have this map in its entirety, but I've uh, just focused in on the right side of the map. And of course, we're looking at Iraq here. We're all very familiar with Iraq due to the last uh, events, the recent history. But uh, almost 130,000 Jews were in Iraq at that time. So there's the country we're looking at. They were the largest, the oldest, and the most distinguished of all Eastern Jewish communities. You see, the Jewish community in Iraq, which includes Babylon, started there with the, uh, with the uh, first, uh, what do you call it, the exodus to Babylon for 70 years, the first deportation to Babylon that we read about in the Bible. And life was so good in Babylon that most Jews decided to stay. Only a small number came back to Israel with Ezra and Nehemiah. The vast majority stayed in Babylon. There was a large community in Babylon during the first century when Yeshua walked the earth. And the community has remained there. Uh, to this day, there's even a few Jews in, in Iraq. And so this is where, this is the roots of the uh, Iraqi Jewish community. It goes all the way back to the Babylonian expulsion in 586. Uh, BC. So the largest, oldest, and most distinguished of all Eastern Jewish communities. The population numbered approximately 130,000 in 1948. Now circumstances for the Iraqi community began to go bad in the 1930s with the Arab right-wing nationalism and the pro-German government. However, in 1948 and 49, during the War of Independence, Iraqi Jewry entered its darkest hour, page 167. Under the cloak of martial law, the, bad, the Baghdad government subjected the nation's Jewish citizens to organized persecution, official persecution. Jewish homes were searched, often pillaged. Hundreds of Jews were arrested, imprisoned, charged with treason. Jews were expelled from the government. Jewish doctors and pharmacists barred from practice. Jewish students expelled from the university. Jewish banks closed. Jewish merchants denied import licenses. The community faced economic ruin. Now with the eight outbreak of fighting in Israel, emigration to Israel was declared a capital offense. You try to emigrate, off with your head. You know, kill them. Nevertheless, the government was intrigued by the prospect of inheriting large quantities of abandoned Jewish property. So in March of 1950, the Iraqi government gave official sanction to Jewish emigration on the condition that the Jews applying for exit permits relinquish their Iraqi citizenship. Iraq's Jews applied for immigration by the tens of thousands. Wow. Nobody wanted to stay. Baghdad then granted permission for air transport, and the great airlift was dubbed Operation Alibaba. It was launched in May 1950. It's also known as Operation Ezra and Nehemiah. So you might see under that name as well. All right, so here's a picture, uh, Operation Alibaba. Here are these Iraqi Jewish people coming down uh, the... The uh, board, the uh, stairway, the El Al stairway in, uh, in Israel. And then using the other name, Operation Ezra and Nehemiah, 
Here's another picture of Iraqi Jews off their aircraft uh, coming into Israel. So, of course, Operation Ezra and Nehemiah, of course, refers to the biblical, refers to the biblical material, where Ezra and Nehemiah and the uh, remnant came back to, to uh, the land of Israel. By the time it ended, by the time the airlift ended in December 1951, 113,000 passengers were flown to the Jewish state. Afterwards, smaller numbers of Jews reached Israel via Iran, bringing the total Iraqi immigration to 121,000. All right, the next uh, heading in your workbook says Jordan annexes the West Bank. I'm going to expand that little bit up here on the screen. I have a map of Jordan in my collection of maps and I couldn't get a date as to when this map was printed. All I can tell you it is, it, it, is that it is pre-1967, okay? And why do I know it's pre-1967? Well, because on the inside of the map there's a little inset. And here's the inset. And uh, this inset shows Jordan sitting among its surrounding countries. You see the red, red country of Jordan there, right? Okay, now, what nations are mentioned here? Well, there's Egypt, there's Saudi Arabia, there's Iraq, there's Kuwait, there's Iraq, there's Iran, there's Turkey, there's the Syrian Arab Republic, there's Lebanon. No, Israel. Yeah, you noticed, huh? Yeah. This was typical of the period that Arab maps would not list Israel as a country. They would not list them. What other country is missing? What else is not on this map? A Palestinian state. Yeah. Okay, do you see a Palestinian state there? Of course you can, you can figure out where Israel is because there are boundaries there. Let's go in close. Huh? Let's go in closer to the map. 1950, Jordan illegally annexed the West Bank. Where's the West Bank? Do you see it there? That little that tumor going into Israel? There it is. Okay. This is not a Palestinian state in 1950. This is Jordan. Did you say illegally? Yes. Yes. They, did, they illegally annexed it. Yes. Uh, in, in violation of international law. Okay. There's no Palestinian state there. The people who are living in that territory we call it Judea, Judea and Samaria today, were Jordanians. They had Jordanian citizenship. Okay, they were not Palestinians. Does that make sense? There is no state of Palestine at this time. The Arabs had rejected the UN, um, the UN arrangement. Israel had accepted it. And uh, the state of Israel does exist. But the state of Palestine does not. Okay, burn that into your brain. 1950. It does not exist. Now, also consider this thought. If Jordan wanted to set up a Palestinian state, wouldn't you say that this was an opportunity to do so? Okay. 1950. No, no Palestinian state and none is set up. None is set up. Okay, for the poor starving, you know, Palestinian refugees, those poor people. Yes. Had Jordan been a country since World War I was that or what did it Yeah, Jordan became a country uh, as the uh, British uh, enacted the mandate they were given. You know, uh, and, the, and these, in fact all of these, uh, most of these countries surrounding Israel became independent um, Arab states uh, as British, uh, Britain and France enacted the mandate given to them. Yeah, most of them are recent. All right, so keep that in mind. 1950, Jordan annexes the West Bank. All right. 1951, Second Knesset elected, tension on the borders increases. Then on page uh, 167 and 168, you have a summary chart of the period from uh, 1947 through 1956. Okay, so you can refer to that just for an overall view of the period. Right now, however, we are going to go to the movies. We are going to view program number two of the DVD, Israel as a Nation of, is Born, hosted by former Foreign Minister Abba Iban. All right, it's a 55-minute documentary, uh, program number two, dealing with 1948 through 1956. And we'll answer Peter's question about 
What happened to the Jewish refugees when they came back into the country? This, uh, this video will uh, deal very clearly with the, uh, with the refugee price cr crisis. Uh, first of all, it deals with the war crisis, the refugee crisis, the economic crisis, the birth pangs here of the nation. The nation has been born, but it still has to grow. Maybe I should call these the growing pains of the nation, okay?